It's my honor and privilege to be able to present a man who really doesn't need any introduction, but that's an old cliche, and I'll give him a little one anyway. Uh, Sasha or Alexander Shulgin, one of our esteemed and revered elders in this field, and a real pioneer in the structure activity relationship studies of the of the alkaloids themselves of the the phenethylamines first and the tryptamines secondly and this morning he's going to talk about the process of discovery and how it goes about that these things can be dreamed up or invented in the laboratory and become reality as many of you may have seen or experienced directly last night and uh of course, everybody knows that you know, Ann Shulgin and Sasha Shulgin wrote PCAL uh, something like six years ago, five years ago, six, I think. And now TCAL, the long-awaited sequel, has come out. And these have really revolutionized the, the availability and accessibility of substances in the last couple of years. And they're having a really great impact, these books, uh, far beyond what uh, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg, really. And uh, for me, it was really important because it was knowing that PCAL was going to come out. I just they published an excerpt in a magazine called The Whole Earth Review, and I hadn't seen the book, but just knowing that it was about to come out caused me to go back to publishing in this field, whereas I'd been doing it for some time, and I stopped because I was worried about attracting attention, legal problems. I was also dealing with my own career, and so. Uh, it actually inspired me to start taking more of a political stand and speaking out and defending our political rights in this area. And uh, I think that people focus a lot on the chemical and scientific importance of PCOL and TCOL, but their political importance is just as great and, and uh, is really a valuable contribution. So on the process of discovery, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Alexander Shulgin. How do I say? Ahoy, ahoy. Yeah, it works. It's always a little strange to be introduced as a, one of the elders. I guess I am. I'm kind of getting on in years. But internally, no one's an elder. Internally, everyone's kind of around 35 or so. And you remain being kind of 35, and so this doesn't work much anymore, and that doesn't work much anymore. Then you have to kind of slow down, then you get this replaced, and then you get that modified. And, uh, and the, someone said the body sort of goes on its own way. But the pleasure is that the internal head stays around 35. And that, that, believe me, is a great blessing. <laughs> um, I am going to try to give a talk in a different way today. I usually get involved. Well, I think the best way of describing it. See, this allows me to prance. I, you can still hear me over here. Ah, good, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, that's problems for you, though. You have to keep looking. Uh, yeah, the uh, equation that is called research, uh, investigation, discovering new things, experimentation, uh, I would make up a slide, except I had some slide problems because I was t using something for the transparencies last night that was slightly opaque, and I drew the transparencies out. I tried them out this morning. They were totally opaque, so I had nothing but black on the screen. So I found, it was given very nicely, something that was transparent, but I haven't tried them out yet, so this is still a mystery to be observed, which is, of course, what life is. Anyway, the, uh, what I want to talk about is not what one finds out in the research area, but how one gets to finding things out in the research area. It's an unusual talk. I draw it up as an equation that A, arrow, B. A gives B. It's a very nice equation. It describes the research process, the investigatory process. You ask a question, that's the A. You scrape, scrape around in the, in the lab or in the bottom of the barrel or in the library or something, that's, that's the arrow. And you come up with the answer, B. And so everyone says, gee, you, you, have, you have just solved a very interesting scientific problem, uh, discovery. Uh, but uh, the asking of the question is part of this process and is very often given short shrift because the, uh, the answer is where you, you get your reward. So sometimes your question is modified by what answer you want, what answer you want to get to. And then you go back and find out what is a good question to ask. 
But either way, uh, the process of getting there is often swept under the, under the table, that arrow thing. For example, in, 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 in um, academic research, Everywhere. There used to be always, you, you go to the universities back in the beginning of the century, early time, last century, beginning of this century. You went to the academic world because it provided a certain amount of stability, academic stability, a, a job. You could interact with students. You could teach. You could do research work. You're given a little laboratory. Some funds came in from the university, and you could stir something or react something or try hybridizing something as you wish. Your questions were of your own making. The funds came from the university. And the answers were happily published in whatever journal were necessary to build up your bibliographic inventory sufficient that you could get tenure and then you could either stop working or uh, continue research at your own freedom. Unfortunately, in the academic world, this has changed more and more. More and more, the B has become the emphasis. Because uh, over the last, I'd say, perhaps 40 years, and recently almost totally, disappeared has been the academic sources of research funds. They say, oh, you want to do research. You want some graduate students. Nice. Get a grant. Go out somewhere and find a source of funds. Find some industry that will give you a contract to do this work. We're not going to give you the money for it. Get the funds. We'll handle your students. We'll handle the postdocs. We'll do your research expenses. We'll take 30% of it for the janitorial needs and the, uh, keeping the garden green. But in general, the funds come from outside. So you get in a situation, um, th this, uh, this I have found more and more in the university, that uh, the answer is dictated by the source of funds, and the source of funds is in turn what dictates the line of research. An example, I made this up, but it's the kind of thing you might encounter. You're curious, what is your question? What is the A of this A gives B? Uh, I have down here, does marijuana influence chromosome division? Now there, there's a neat question. People are talking about mar marijuana is good, marijuana is bad, dangerous, not dangerous, uh, innocuous, it should be, it should not be this and that. Does it influence chromosome division? That is not what you may want to ask for reasons of your own. But what you end up asking is, do, mar do marijuana users have excessive chromosome breaks? You're still looking at marijuana, you're still looking at chromosomes, buckle smears, few generations, look at them under a microscope running 1.8% breakage. And then you try to get people who have been smoking marijuana, maybe look at their smears, and maybe you find something in 2.2, or maybe 1.6. You find 2.2, well, it's, as they would say, it is not statistically significant, but it's suggestive. I love the way you can euphemize these answers to maintain your grant renewal. Uh, so, so you get your grant, it is funded, and you end up, say, let's say, for, for example, in your academic world, you end up not finding significant amount of chromosome breaks. So, you say, if yes, of course, you will say marijuana uh, causes genetic damage. If no, you say, no, chromosome damage was seen from marijuana use, or associated with marijuana use. But, the paper gets published in whatever journal it is you publish it in, with keywords such as marijuana, genetic damage, chromosomes, uh, reprodu reproduction risks. All these are pejorative terms that apply back to the paper, even though the paper was a clean bill of health. So this is a form of very subtle psychologically influencing the granting agent in the U.S. government. The various governments love doing it as long as it applies. It's in some way the answers can apply to what their current political needs are. It's a sorry shift from the academic purity of research to the practicality of putting a dollar sign on that B of A gives B and then working back from that to where the A is. Industry is not much cleaner. There used to be a term known as fundamental research. Sometimes it was called exploratory research. Go in the lab, putsy around, just have fun, and see anything comes up that would be of value. This is you know, ideal. I mean, anyone would love this. This is the academic world of, of, of uh, 75 years ago. Play around. Enjoy exploring. Then more and more, uh, the term I have heard used quite a bit, uh, I think they're called bean counters. People in industry who look at the bottom line and see if this line of research is really economically uh, valuable. Is there not another line that could be more efficiently followed? The people in the accounting office tend more and more to dictate the direction of research because they are the ones who will eventually have to pay out the check to the uh, uh, laborers, to the people, to the employees, and that check must come from the funds that come from the selling of a product that comes out of that research. Uh, for example, uh, 
you might have a person in the, in the research department talking to the accountant who says, you know, DuPont has just come up with a seven fluorosteroid that is rather effective in uh, treating something or other that 